Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for being here. So appreciate it. I'm Beth Derry, the president of the Board of Trustees at the Temple, and I am so excited to welcome you to what is going to be an amazing program. I'd like to introduce Rabbi Yael Dadoun. Uh, Rabbi Dadoun was born into a Moroccan-Tunisian-Israeli family and began her career as a Jewish educator in Miami. After three years, she returned to Hebrew Union College and was ordained as a rabbi in May of 2020. We are incredibly fortunate that she has been our rabbi um, and an integral part of our community ever since. We love having Rabbi Dadoun, her husband Joe Norditsky, and their two amazing children as part of our family. Uh, and one fun fact about Rabbi Dadoun, she rode motorcycles in her 20s. <laughs> um, our guest this evening is Rabbi Josh Weinberg. Rabbi Weinberg is Vice President of the URJ for Israel and Reform Zionism and is the Executive Director of ARTSA, the Association of Reform Zionism of America. Rabbi Weinberg is also a reserve officer in the IDF and has hiked the Israeli Trail, which I have to tell you looked fascinating. Rabbi Weinberg lives with his family in New York. He has taught and lectured widely throughout Israel, the US, and Europe. He is passionate about the environment and anything connected to Israel. Rabbi Weinberg's goal is to strengthen the connection between the reform movement and the Jewish state, and we are thrilled to have him here with us this evening. Two fun facts about Rabbi Weinberg. He was on the Jerusalem volleyball team, and he has led Shabbat on five continents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth Derry. Shalom. Welcome to everyone. It is such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and so many not so familiar faces. Um, welcome home, welcome back, or welcome for the first time. We're so happy you could be here with us. And of course, welcome to everybody who's joining us from near and far on live stream. We're so happy that you're here. My name is Rabbi Yael Dadun, and it is my very distinct privilege to be a rabbi in this wonderful congregation. And I'm very excited to have this conversation this evening Tonight, I'm hoping we are going to unpack uh, and further comprehend some of the changes taking place in Israel over the last few months. For the last 34 weeks, Israelis from all faiths and walks of life in partnership with visiting supporters have taken to the streets in protests to the recent changes made by the government that has uh, not only affected Israeli citizens, but people all over the world and the neighboring region. And before we engage in what I know is going to be a very vibrant conversation, there's four things I'd like for us to keep in mind. The first, and I would argue perhaps the most important, we are witnessing the greatest experiment in Jewish history called Israel. Our Torah repeatedly talks about this notion of a promised land. For example, Exodus 32, 13, Remember your descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, how you swore to them and said, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give you your offspring, the whole land of which I spoke of, to possess. Second thing I'd like for us to think about is it's very tempting to make direct parallels between the American government, how we view the world as Americans, and how Israelis, uh, Israeli democracy, the, the Jewish democracy in the Middle East governs itself. And there are many times where those parallels are very appropriate. Um, and they're not identical. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about Israel. Israel and, and its, its cities are not Cleveland, they're not New York, they're not Miami. They're not exactly, they don't share the same history that we do. Israel is 75 years young. And if we look at where we were in the United States after, 70, after our 75th birthday in approximately 1850, 
we too would have some blemishes that would be challenging to deal with. So the comparison is, um, it, while it's very automatic in our minds, it's not always a direct parallel. And lastly, Israel was born in a neighborhood that is devoid of other democracies. And the region has really no underpinnings of democracy, and much of their democratic development has been done in a sort of a vacuum. But nonetheless, like any time in Jewish history, there is complexity, and we're very excited to dive into that complexity. And like many of you, I've been reading the news nonstop lately and trying to learn and really wrap my mind on what's going on in Israel at this time. And Rabbi Weinberg, you're the first person I thought to help and bring some clarity and complexity. I invite you to bring the complexity as well. Don't ask who is number two. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited to engage in this conversation with you. Well, thank you, Rabbi Dadon, and thank you all. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm, um, this is my first time in this sanctuary, in this congregation, um, and uh, I, I feel like I'm standing or sitting on the shoulders of giants. Of course, you know, sort of the legendary Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver, who um, really represented American Jewry in helping uh, the state of Israel be recognized and, and, and be established. And you, know, you ask Israeli kids who, there's like an Abba Hillel Silver Street mm. in many cities yeah. around Israel. And they're like, you know, who is that? And most of them don't know. I said, well, here, let me tell you. And they're like, okay, who is this guy giving us a lecture? Um, but, but, you know, his, his, uh, his reputation is, you know, I think precedes him. And, and, and all of you here, of course, Rabbi Dick Hirsch, I want to mention, who was, you know, the grandfather of Reform Zionism and also of social justice movements here in the United States and, you know, came, came from here, came from Cleveland. Um, and it, can I just give two quick shout outs? I, you, you know, may. I'm going to miss everyone, you know, but I just want to say a shout out to my friend Lori Resnick, who's here, who's, who I, who's responsible for me in this position, who's the chair of the search committee that, that got me hired. Um, so, um, gee, thanks, Lori. Um, Thank you. Know, you. And, Thank uh, you. And I also want to give a shout out to my friend, uh, Dr. Tom Abelson, who's here for a long, long time URJ board member um, from Anche Chesed Fairmount Congregation and uh, a partner with us in all of our Israel work. And so thank you for, for all you do. And, and I, I just have to say, do I need to tell you how amazing Rabbi Dadun is? Yeah. Give it, give it up. I see a lot of congregations and I see a lot of rabbis. Um, but she is something special, and she's a star in our movement, not just in Cleveland. Okay, be on there. So you, I hope that you don't take it for granted, and you're like, wait a second, not all rabbis are this dynamic, knowledgeable, personable, all of these things. And your congregation is one of the best-run organizations that, that I've seen. Your professionalism, your facility, everything. It's been amazing in the few hours that I've been here. So thank you for the warm welcome uh, to me, and I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into the issues. Thank you, Josh. Thank yeah. you so much. So let's start with a very big question, maybe a little bit broad. Tell us a little bit about the protest movement. How did we get to this moment? Some people are calling this the protest of the silent uh, majority. Who is that silent majority? And who is the very vocal minority? And what does that mean for us? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think the, my, the majority is so silent. I mean, the, you know, the people have been protesting, you know, probably like a typical crowd here on a Friday night, like 160,000 people coming out Every you know, on the streets of Tel Aviv um, week after week. And when we say that this protest movement is unprecedented, right, Israel has had its fair share of protests in the past. How many of you remember the massive protests of like 350 or maybe 400,000 people in 1983 to protest the war in Lebanon? Okay, you may remember that. How many of you remember in 2011, where for a month over the entire summer, the streets of Tel Aviv and like 14 other cities were filled with tent cities of people, you know, you know, piling out, you know, coming out of the woodwork to protest the high cost of life in Israel, if you remember. And even a year ago, they were called the Balfour protests, where people would protest outside the prime minister's house every week, weekend, but nothing like what we're seeing now. Now, there is a question about the majority and the minority, and I want to say that this, um, this, didn't, this didn't come out of nowhere. Okay, this has been building up, some say, for five years. I mean, how many elections have we had in the past five years? 
show of hands, just, you know, yeah, five, we have every Monday and Thursday a different elections. <laughs> it in, corresponds in, with in, Torah reading, Torah, exactly, right? Exactly, so, exactly. You know, yeah. we exercise our democracy, you know, on steroids, kind of. Um, but but the, we have had five elections in the last four years, um, but this has been building up for, for way longer than that. Um, and no one is, is no one is, you know, no one is contesting the fact that this government was elected by a majority. Okay, and that is critically important for us to understand. We are not saying that this is an illegitimate government. What we are saying is that the government is trying to change the rules of the game. Right? And that what is legitimate for a majority to do and what is not. Okay, what is kosher and what is outside the rules of fair play in a democracy. Okay, and I want to say even beyond that, because that I think that there's two essential reasons for what we're seeing right now. One technical and the one sort of overarching, and I want to get to that and sort of what were some milestones along the way. Okay, one, I think the technical reasons, well, let's, let's, can we, can we, can we do a, like a, an experiment here? I'm going to ask the question, what is this moment about? And you shout out like one or two words, okay? that you're feeling this. So what is this moment in Israel about right now? Go. Okay. Hey, I, I, in the virtual world, word cloud that is created now, like, you know, hovering above us right now, I heard democracy. I heard judiciary. I heard power. I heard rights. Okay. And that's about as good as I could capture. Okay. Anything that I missed? Power. Right. Anything else? Dictatorship. Okay. The potential. Anything else? Okay, yes, those are all true, but I'm going to suggest that those are all symptoms. And that it's really essentially about two things. Here's the technical piece. One, the fact that Israel does not have a constitution. Okay, and a constitution has supreme civil authority. Okay, we don't have that. That's the technical piece. And we're going to get into why in a second. The bigger piece, I think, is that what we are seeing are competing visions for what it means to have a Jewish state. And that is what is at stake here. And that is what people are arguing about and, and, and passing bills and laws in the Knesset and pouring out into the streets to protest. And we see this is unprecedented, not only with the protests, but with the amount of elections we've had, right, which is also unprecedented. Give us a little bit more about the lead-up, right? Yep. What, how, how did we get here? Israel was established in 1948. What are markers that happened in 48? And we can also make the argument that it's not just 48. It's also 50, 67, 95, maybe 2005. Yeah, yeah. Help us understand the historical context of why we're here. Okay, so we really need like a full semester's course <laughs> to like get into all these. But let me try and go like a few points. First of all, what happened in 1948? The establishment of the state of Israel, the war, what we call the War of Independence, okay? But leading up to the establishment, there were a few questions that were buzzing around that were not answered on May 14th, 1948, or the fifth day of the month of E.R. Tashach, as we say in Hebrew, 1948. And frankly, some of them are still not answered. So can I give you three quick examples? People came to Ben-Gurion and said, wait a second, you're going to establish the state. What's the name of the state going to be? It wasn't a given. There was a short list, right? The Yehuda, Zion, different options of what, of what it could be. Okay, and he said, ah, we'll, we'll figure that one out. Others came and said, you're going to establish a state, but what are the borders of the country? That might be a slightly important detail, okay, to mention. If you're going to have a state, you have to draw a map and, and, and you know, publish it and be, you know, in the, in the community of nations in the UN and, and, and so on. Um, and he said, never mind, never mind. Um, and the other question that was sort of, you know, buzz, you know, bu bubbling up was what, if this is a Jewish state, what is the place of religion? What is the place of Judaism going to be in the state? And again, never mind, never mind. We, we have to establish. Now, what was the urgency there? Can you say a few well, words the, about okay. the urgency? So, so the British mandate was ending, and they knew that if they, they Ben-Gurion was right about most things. Just ask him, he'll tell you. Okay, just <laughs> read in his diary. Um, 
that, that there was, the British mandate was ending, and he thought that if, if we missed this moment, okay, then some other body would come in and, and take so over. So there was a very short window to make very major decisions. A hundred percent, right? It was Friday afternoon before Shabbat, okay? To this day, only one of those three questions have been answered. Okay, can you guess which one? Right, okay, right. It is called the State of Israel, Medinat Yisrael in Hebrew, Okay. In 1948, we established this declaration. Um, we, we, we read it with the Declaration of the State. Okay, if you want, I can make that a little smaller so you can see it from the back. Okay, right. Um, in which we outline the vision. And this is critically important because if you scroll down to, um, I think, paragraph 17, it says, no later than October 1st, 1948, we will have a constitution. Okay, do we have a constitution? That's like a lot of late fees at the public library, okay, right now, you know, since 75 years later. What we did establish was a constitutional committee, okay? So how many of you have ever served on a committee before <laughs> in life? Okay, I promise it is the best way to get anything done, okay? So, so, so but why don't we have a constitution? So this is 1940. This is critically important. Why don't we have a constitution, okay? Essentially because... Those who came from traditions of liberal democracies and were looking at the United States, we're looking at Great Britain, we're looking at some countries in Europe, and so we have to have a constitution. And some others are saying, wait a second, we Jewish people, we have a constitution, and we keep ours in the ark right behind us, or in front of you. Okay? And people are saying, well, wait a second. We're, we're, we're an advanced industrial democracy. We're not going to be, they weren't so industrial then, it was just an advanced democracy. Okay, we're not going to have the Torah be our constitution. Okay, that, no way. And so to this day, that's, that's a big issue. Look what happened in 1950. Israel passes the law of return, in which any Jew can automatically go through the naturalization process and become a citizen of the Jewish state. What's the next question that you have to ask? Who is a Jew? And who has the authority to determine who is a Jew? Okay, we are still, as the reform movement, arguing those cases right now. But something else happened. A conversation between David Ben-Gurion and the Chazon Ish. His, his name is um, Rabbi, uh, he's not, actually not an ordained rabbi, but he's a Rebbe, okay? Avram uh, uh, Kalanimus, I think is his name. Um, and he pleaded with Ben-Gurion to say, please exempt 400 yeshiva students from mandatory conscription in the Israeli army, in the IDF. Right? Now, we said that Ben-Gurion was right about everything. Was he right about this one? No, he got this one wrong because he said, fine, fine, no, kinderlach, okay, whatever. We'll give you this exemption because he thought that the ultra-Orthodox Jews who were living in Israel, who had been living there all along, and most of them, you know, remember the Haredi world. I, I'm going to use the term Haredi. Is that okay? Because that's, that's the term that they prefer, um, which really means God-fearing Jews, were, were completely decimated in the Holocaust. Okay? So the goal was to rebuild their community, and to do that, they need two things. Large families, okay, have lots of children, and institutions, yeshivot, right? Jewish education. Let's have that. So he goes, we can't, we can't be studying Torah. Uh, we can't be fighting in the army. We have to study Torah full time. But Ben Green thought, he said, okay, we have our own state now. You can assimilate, essentially. You don't have to live in an insular community anymore to protect the tradition, protect the faith, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you can do that. And so he gave them this uh, exemption. So 400 turned into 75,000. Okay, and it became a major issue. As we saw just two weeks ago, there was a, a bill proposed in the Knesset to equate service in the army with full-time Torah study. Okay? Can I just mention two other dates that we, there were three? You know, is it um, 1967, we all know, how many of you remember the Six-Day War? Okay. Um, the Six-Day War led to a situation in which Israel's ruling over this, these borders, you know, tripled, and Israel's ruling over these territories. Some call it the West Bank, some call it Judea and Samaria, right, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, okay? And um, remember 1968, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Levi Eshkol, comes to Washington, D.C., and he sits with an American president. His name was Lyndon Baines Johnson, okay? You may remember him? And Johnson asked him, he said, what are you going to do with this territory? And he said, he, he said it, I don't think Johnson understood Yiddish, okay? I, you know, the Texan, you know, like whatever. Okay, but he said, ich weiß, 
Okay, he says, he says I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay, and that lack of resolution has kicked the can down 56 years, and we have this untenable situation in which Israel is maintaining a military rule over 3.8 million Palestinians, okay? So that is part of it, okay? 1995, we have another, um, what some call a judicial revolution. In 2005, we mentioned that, um, and thank you, Rabbi Dun, for, for mentioning that date, because that is a traumatic date for many in the national religious camp when Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip. It was exactly um, 18 years ago last week, okay, from Gush Katif, from the 14 Jewish settlements that were, uh, you know, existing in the Gaza Strip, okay? And for many, that is a point of particular trauma, okay, that exists in that community. And while many of us, like, don't think about that every day, that, that, is, very much, that is very much public. We could go on with the history lesson, but I, I want us to understand that some of these issues have been bubbling up for, for, for quite a long time and are now spilling over into the streets. So as I ask the next many questions I have, um, another one just came to my mind as we're speaking. There are um, many decisions that, is, that Israel has decided not to decide on. Right, has actively decided not to decide on. So as you're giving the answers to some of these other questions, can you also touch on that and what are the repercussions of that? Yeah. I wanna switch gears a tiny bit here and I wanna talk a little bit about the reasonableness cause yeah. because this is kind of what um, blew up in the last few weeks. So first of all, what, what is this reasonable, reasonableness cause, and what is the government actually proposing having to do with the reasonableness cause, and what agendas do they have that's leading to some of the challenges we're seeing okay. today? Yeah, so the, how many of you have heard about this, the reasonableness clause, okay, or in Hebrew, ilat hasvirut, right? Now, il, the reasonableness clause is one, I, this, I, I'm just warning you, this may be slightly boring, Okay, this is the boring part where I want you know, to understand some of these. Anybody sit and read through the entire proposed legislation from the Knesset so far? Okay, uh, one, okay, Tzadik Echad Bistom, as they say, one righteous person in stone. Okay, fantastic. By the way, most Israelis haven't either, <laughs> including those going out to protest. They're like, okay, democracy, yes, important. But we're not sure because what we're seeing now is... Um, it, it, uh, is a, an overlaying multi-levels here of different agendas competing, a, a, as you alluded to. Um, and so, so let, let's look at what happened, right? If we said that Israel doesn't have a constitution, okay, what it does have is a series of basic laws. Here, we'll go to that. I'm not going to bore you with all this stuff, okay? Basically, they said, instead of a constitution, let's do it one by one, and we got this situation of basic laws. Okay, they're about... 13 of them now. Basically, think about it like the Bill of Rights without the Constitution. Okay? One of those laws is the Judiciary Law from 1984, in which they said that Supreme Court judges can um, nullify decisions of government officials, specifically ministers in the government, if they deem it to be unreasonable. Okay? And this is based on British law. Hey, do we have any lawyers in the crowd? At all? Okay. It's a synagogue, Rabbi Weinberg. Yes, do we have like, a, a, like a, a minyan of lawyers, maybe? Okay, so you, you remember this? Um, and th this was deemed, to, you know, they, they could decide that something was unreasonable, or in some cases, extremely unreasonable. All right, I'll give you two examples. In the last government, it was, we called it the change government. Naftali Bennett was the, the prime minister, okay, and then Yair Lapid became prime minister, if you remember. They appointed a finance minister, a, a guy called Avigdor Lieberman. Okay, now Avigdor Lieberman comes from uh, a party called um, Israel Beitenu, Israel's our home, mainly uh, one of the Russian speaking parties. Um, he is sort of, I would say, right of center on security issues but very, very left on issues of religion and state. And he said, I will not sit in a government with the Haredi party, so which there are two. And he's the one who caused this cycle of elections. Okay, so he became finance minister on his first day in office, wasting no time. He said, I'm going to remove the government subsidies for ultra-Orthodox child care. Okay, he says... If you're not working, or if you're just, you know, the more kids you have, the more government subsidies you get. And she goes, so that's terrible, 
and I'm angry at you, and I'm going to remove those, you know, take them right out of the budget. Okay? Supreme Court weighed in and said, um, uh, they said, dude. Okay, no, they didn't say that. Okay, they said, dude, you can't do that. Okay, like, y y that's not fair. You can't overnight pull people's childcare out from under them. Okay, that's, that, you know, w w we can't have that situation. That is unreasonable. Okay, so they, they walked back the decision of a government official. Fast forward to November of 2022. Okay, we have elections. The government goes back, and we now have what's called, uh, uh, have you heard this in Hebrew before? Memshelet yamin al-male. Okay? A full tank of a right-wing government, essentially. Okay? Um, that's when you pull up to, like, this, the full-service gas station in Israel. You say, simli al-male. You know, just fill her up. Okay? So this is the right-wing government. And, okay, they, um, the, Netanyahu says, I'm going to appoint my loyal buddy, the head of the Shas party, a guy called Aryeh Derry, he's going to be, he's going to have two portfolios. He's going to have the health minister and the ministry of the interior. Minor problem with that is that not only did Aryeh Derry sit in jail for three years in the early 2000s for corruption, but he was also convicted already of tax fraud um, and said, I won't seek higher office. This was like a year and a half ago, okay? So the Supreme Court weighed in and said, okay, we think that it is not only unreasonable, but extremely unreasonable, right? kitzonit, as they say in Hebrew, that someone who's convicted of tax fraud could be the minister of the ministry that is responsible for collecting taxes. Okay? I, I don't know. Okay? So they ruled it, and, and, and they said, no, that's, that, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not going to happen. And so the okay. reasonableness clause is actually a kind of a checks and balances. What it is call absolutely a checks and balances. A checks and balances. Yeah, a, a, absu absolutely. And the government, the, the Knesset passed this on July 23rd to remove the reasonableness clause. Wait, I even have a slide for it. Hold on. Okay. Um, well, yeah, there we go. Okay, see the reasonableness clause. Now, um, they removed it, and you could, what you saw before this um, is people camping out in the, in, the, in the park just below the Knesset overnight to protest this. Now, is the removal of the reasonableness clause, something that few people have heard of, Israelis included, going to signal the end of democracy as we know it? Okay? We used to say this in Israel. Remember, remember when, how many of you have visited kibbutz in Israel, like in the 60s or 70s? Okay? Um, in the early 80s, they introduced television into the kibbutz. Okay? And people said, that's it! That's the end of the kibbutz! Okay? If we have television. Right? Okay, that's, so somebody's like, this is the end of democracy, the end of the kibbutz right now. Okay, no, it's not. Okay. However, however, this is what we call the, in Hebrew, the shitat salami Right? They say, okay, they're not going to give us the entire salami straight up. They're going to cut it in slices and feed us bit by bit. Okay? And this is like the first domino to fall in like the, I saw a Rube Goldberg exhibit out there. Right? This is like the first domino to fall, and that's why we're scared. And what the, if I were cynical, which... Thankfully, I'm not, I, neither of us, I think, are, no, no. have any cynicism in us at all. None. But if we did, I might say that, um, that why are people so worried about the reason? Why is it so important for the coalition to remove the reasonableness clause? Could it be because they want to do things that might be considered unreasonable? Okay, in which case, let's make sure that no one can, uh, can stop us from doing those things. Now, oh, let, let's pause there for a second. You know, that, that's essentially what we're looking at, and it's part of a larger sort of set of legislative you know, initiatives or proposals that are all part of a judicial reform. So we can go in two directions. Yeah. And I'm going to stall so you can drink. Let's go forward. Let's go, yeah, let's go yeah. forward. Okay. So two things. One, what is the next salami slice that we're to expect and that this current government in, in some ways has shared some of the agenda already? Yeah. So that's Aleph. But um, why can't the judiciary, this, this system, say, hold on, this, this notion of removing the unreasonableness clause is, in fact, very unreasonable, and say, we're done with this notion. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it, the, the Knesset, the, le the legislative branch is trying to reduce the powers of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court can come and say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do that, okay? That is unconstitutional, even though we don't have a constitution, okay? Don't, say, don't tell anyone. Um, so, 
so immediately after this was passed, it was passed 64 to nothing, by the way, because the entire opposition um, recused themselves. Yeah, they, they all walked out. Um, essentially, seven petitions were filed to the Supreme Court, and those are going to be heard on September 12th. Okay, and they are going to be heard. And for the first time, as you can see in the picture, this is, this is the first time that the entire panel of Supreme Court judges is going to sit and hear this case. Okay, that's how significant it is. It's usually, uh, it, you know, there are 15 judges in the Supreme Court. Sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's nine, 11, 13. Okay, um, it, it, there are different cases that warrant different number of judges. Okay, whatever. This is the first time that everyone is going to sit to hear this. And they very could, you know, they very likely could deem this to be un unreasonable with great irony, okay, um, and to say that it's unconstitutional, then what could happen, and this is the dangerous situation, it could cause a constitutional crisis in which the army and the police and the security forces would have to decide, okay, who you're going to listen to, right? In some countries, this would be called a coup d'etat, okay, in which the military comes in and says, okay, we're in charge now. Um, that is not happening. We're actually seeing the opposite. Um, and here, I don't know if any of you caught the interview between George Stephanopoulos on ABC News and Prime Minister Netanyahu um, on July 24th or 25th, okay, where he asked him plain out, said, Mr. Prime Minister, if the Supreme Court strikes this down, are you going to abide by the ruling of the Supreme Court? Okay, which should have been a yes or no answer. Okay, um, I don't know if you've ever heard Prime Minister Netanyahu speak before. Okay, um, he, he said, well, I hope it won't come to that, and the Supreme Court shouldn't strike this down because this is the will of the people in electing a majority, and Stephanopoulos said yes or no. He said, well, I, you know, I don't... So what he didn't say was yes. Okay, and the defense establishment came back. The defense minister, Gallant, and the chief of staff of the army came and said, okay, Absolutely, we will abide by the Supreme Court, which I, I think gave me and many of us and many Israelis, okay, a lot of hope to say, all right, okay, th there is some, you know, sens sensibility here uh, to say that, you know, we're, we're going, you know, Israel still is a country of, uh, w w with the rule of law. Um, and, and you asked, you know, what, what are we going to see next? Okay, so the Knesset is going to come back on October 12th. And what I think we're going to see is continued efforts to push through this. I, I, think, I think, by the way, a lot of the coalition were caught off guard by the severity or sort of the magnitude of the protests. I don't think they were anticipating that. They said, we were elected. We can do whatever we want, okay? Um, we can change the election law, potentially. Okay, that's what a lot of people are worried about, to say, oh, yeah, by the way, there aren't going to be any more elections. Right? Some people say, okay, you're you're drastically exaggerating, okay? Um, I, I wouldn't say drastically, <laughs> okay? That, that, that's where I am on this right now. Now, I think what we're going to see is continued efforts to push through the judicial reforms, naming, you know, the committee who appoints judges, potentially getting to the override clause. But what we're also going to see are other agendas that are not exactly aligned with the judicial reforms, but are based on that. So here's our coalition right here. Wait, is, where'd they go? Yeah, don't send it. These guys, okay? These are the five parties, or really six parties, okay, that are in the ruling coalition, and they each have a different agenda. So one agenda that we're going to see is the draft bill to completely exempt ultra-Orthodox from the army. This is a whole session on itself. All I'll say is that it's a, it's a particular catch-22 because the army doesn't want them. It's much more of a headache for the army to have thousands and thousands of ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students to which they have to go, you know, to somersaults in the air, essentially, to accommodate them. Yeah, exactly. The army doesn't want them. However, however, it leads to so many other societal problems to say that they are completely exempt. Okay? We are very, very concerned about a law that could do two things. One, change that law of return that I mentioned that it was, was enacted in 1950. Because if you remember, in 1970, they added a clause called the Grandchild Clause, where it says that anyone who has one Jewish grandparent is entitled to citizenship in the state of Israel. Now, be careful, because 
having one Jewish grandparent doesn't necessarily make one halachically Jewish. Okay? And we have to differentiate between that. Okay? Because the Orthodox organizations, the Orthodox parties are saying, no, this is, this is a big problem for us. Right? And I understand that as a student of you know, Jewish law, as, as we are. However, to get citizenship, that is on the table now to be changed, as is a law that's called, you know, a, how do you say, Chokokef Bagatz, right? A law that will circumvent the Supreme Court, essentially, on a ruling that we won in March of 2021, whereby the state of Israel will recognize reform and conservative conversions in Israel. Just think, how many of you know someone, or you yourself, or have a family member who converted to Judaism? Okay? Now, Conversion in Israel, I just want to keep it, I just want to remind how high the stakes are, okay? Conversion is not just about, okay, now you can be a member of our, you know, congregation, and you can say, Asher Bachar Banu, okay, who chose us, right? C conversion is equal to citizenship. In many cases, it comes with a work permit, and it comes with health care, okay? So we have cases of people who are waiting 10 or 15 years for their conversion to be recognized, and one case of a woman who you know, had to pay out of pocket for cancer treatment, okay, because her citizenship wasn't recognized because of conversion. So we're, we're and we, it's a big case that we won, uh, we being the reform movement in Israel in 2021, and that's on the docket, um, including, you know, giving extra powers to rabbinic courts, um, and, and, and I, I could go on and on. Um, that's sort of what we're looking at right now in the next uh, month. So, um, you know, enjoy the holidays. Okay, and then um, <laughs> we, have to, uh, we have to be very vigilant. Yeah. You mentioned the reservists, and I want to go back there for just a moment. What's going on with the reservists in Israel? Why does that matter, and why is it unusual? Okay, so as we see the protest movement taking shape, and here's just one example, every week there are different signs that you can like see from the moon, okay, that like you go down, they stretch them out, including sometimes holding out like, you know, the Declaration of Independence, um, as, you know, on top of everyone's head uh, during the main protest. Um, what's been interesting to see is that these protests are not just one organization, not just one, pol no political parties are involved in the protest, and they, to date, 34 weeks, have not had one single sitting politician speak, okay? I will say a, a personal point of pride that the first non-Israeli, there have been about four or five so far, the first non-Israeli to speak at the protest was Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the president of the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism, um, who basically gave a message of solidarity, um, and, and, and people were coming up to us it's saying... Very well received. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. so moving, yeah. just people's reaction to say, you know, Toda, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, one couple, just, this is off, off to, you know, this is a tangent, okay? I don't know rabbis who go on tangents ever, no. okay? <laughs> but, but... There was a couple who went to see Rabbi Meir Azari, who is the senior reform rabbi in Tel Aviv, on the Sunday morning after that Saturday night protest. And they came to see him about to, you know, officiating at their wedding. And he always asked them, he said, why did you choose me? You know, why did you come to a reform rabbi? And they said, you know, we knew that we weren't going to get married to the chief rabbinate, which lots of people now either, they, you know, they fly over to Cyprus, or they do something that we call you do in bitzibur. I think we call it in English common law marriage. Okay, we have that. And just, okay, we're married. Yeah, fine. We're not going through the, the rabbinate. And they said, you know, we were out there on Kaplan Street in Tel Aviv last night, and we heard this reform rabbi speak at, at the protest. And we said, we want to be a part of that. We, we want that. Okay, that's, that, 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 was, that, was, that, was motive, that was inspiring to us. So here we are. We want you to do our wedding. We want to become of this reform movement, okay? So it, 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 it's, it's little things happening. So, so all these different groups are coming together to formulate this protest movement. One of them were um, high-tech executives who are saying, look, um, we love Israel, we're Zionists, and we want to invest in Israel, but we're very worried about, you know, what, what's happening here. Um, and by the way, instability is not good for business, okay? Um, an, another group are, you know, academics who are speaking out. And I think the most powerful group, as, as, as you rightly said, are the reservists. Remember, there's mandatory conscription, but Israel's wars in the past were not won by the sadirnikim, as we call them, by the people in mandatory service. They were won by the reservists, okay? And we still 
You know, with all of our Zionist mythology, right, we still hold the pilots on this, like, higher echelon. And a couple of weeks ago, on the 1st of August, actually, a thousand pilots, reservist pilots, signed this declaration, signed this letter, saying that we are going to refuse to show up for training until this is off the table. Which is a very significant number for Israeli reservists and the pilots, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. So that has led to some to say, okay, the, e either the, pilot, the reservist response or the judicial reforms themselves are actually harming national security. Okay, and, and, and they're weakening us, which, y y you know, is, is very dangerous because Israel is still facing existential threats, okay, from its neighbors, from the region, okay, and to not have that, what we call the readiness, the kshirut, as we say in Hebrew, is, is, really, is really detrimental. I mean, the prime minister left his vacation in the Golan Heights um, last week to come in and sit with the top brass of the military to say, okay, wh what are we going to do about this? And they're like, well, what are you going to do <laughs> about this? Um, and, and remember, the army in Israel has, is like the holy cow, or the, the sacred cow, as we say, not holy, right? Um, is, is the sacred cow. And once the fabric of Israel's sort of, you know, collectivism military, even though probably 35 to 40 percent of Israeli citizens don't serve in the army, including Israel's Arab or Palestinian citizens, um, the Haredim, right? That is a major, major issue and a major, major problem. And we're seeing that in some of these reservists, some of these generals who signed up and saying, listen, you broke the social contract. Okay, not to get too philosophical, you know, like Hobbes and Locke and, and you know, Kant and, 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 you know, Western philosophy, but, but there was a social contract. And that we as pilots wanted to know, we need to know, we need to rest assured that when you tell us and you give us coordinates to fire at, essentially, that those are legitimate and that they're not politicized and they're not coming from anyone's agenda. And, and, we, and we don't feel that way right now, okay? So we'll do our part once you do your... That, that's essentially the conversation that's, um, that, that, that's taking place right now. And we know you mentioned the high-tech, and I, I'd love to hear more about that, hear you expound on that. A high, you know, high-tech in Israel is, serves, what, 25% of Israeli's economy. Yeah. Um, you know, when we think about Israel, we think about travel, and um, their tourism is actually only 3% of their economy, which is why they were able to really survive COVID. But 25%, that's a significant number. So what are these high-tech individuals feeling, and, and how are they um, responding to what's going on in Israel and globally? Because this is affecting the global market. Right, right. I think, I, I think look, like, first of all, it's, it's not like rocket science. People are saying, okay, here's a government that's unstable and that's going to um, be bad for security and stability, so we're going to take our investments elsewhere. I mean, I think anywhere in the world, and we're looking at, you know, how is Israel being raided by some of the, um, you, you know, s some of the... Um, what, what do we call them, you know, Moody's and Standard and & Poor's, and, you know, all of them are looking at, um, looking at the credit rating uh, of Israel. And, but I think it's, it's actually something beyond that, because Netanyahu is a fascinating character, and I, and I really urge you to read um, a, a recent biography by Anshel Pfeffer from Haaretz it's called, called Bibi, um, and he, he sees himself as sort of above the fray on, you know, day-to-day -day issues. He sees himself as a world leader. And I'm not saying this with any judgment. I'm, I'm just sort of, you know, uh, an analysis of him is that he sees himself as someone who, who is a world leader, who cares about essentially two things. Israel becoming a leader in the world economy and the ability to play sort of the geopolitics of the moment, specifically the nuclear threat coming from Iran. Okay, and he says, I'm not dealing with religion and state issues or social welfare or, y y you know, education issues. Uh, you know, and, and that's why he was happy to give those ministries away to other parties. Okay, for me, defense and the economy. That's what's important. So when people say, okay, we, we want to do something that will um, spark his interest. You know, when we were there over the spring, and the, as the leadership of the reform movement, we sat with many, you know, different ministers in the government, two of which who are now in the opposition. This is Lieberman, who I mentioned earlier, and Gidon Sa'ar, who was the former justice minister, not a lefty by any stretch, okay, but a guy, an honest guy of deep integrity, who um, the, the previous June when we sat with him was myself, Rabbi Jacobs, and, and our board chair, Jennifer Kaufman, and his phone was ringing off the hook. 
Okay, this is in, in June of 2021, and we're like, uh, like, do you want to get that? You know, and, and he said, no, I, I know who it is. It's, it's, it's Netanyahu, and he's calling to offer me to become prime minister if I join him. I said, yeah, I would answer that. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, like take a message or something, you know, like, you know. Um, and he said, listen, I looked myself in the mirror, and, and I knew that he didn't have my best interest in mind. Hard offer to turn down, by the way, to become prime minister, but I knew that it would not end well. So I, you know, I'm fine being justice minister with, with Naftali Bennett. And we asked the two of them. We asked the two of them. We said, listen, you have the most, um, we said, kilometrage, okay? You have the most <laughs> mileage, essentially, with Netanyahu. Okay, two questions. One, how far will he go in this? And two, what will move him? What will influence him? And they, you know, they kind of nodded and like they said, listen, he'll, he'll, we know him well. He'll drive the bus off the cliff. Um, and the only thing at, at the time, he said, the only thing at the time that will really move him, really affect him, is high-level American pressure. Okay? Because uh, he, he shrugged it off. But in that live TV interview when Biden said, um, okay, no, no invitations to the White House, he invited President Herzog, okay, just a few weeks ago. Um, there's rumors now that when he comes to New York for the UN General Assembly, um, just between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, apropos Yamim Noraim, okay, right? <laughs> These days of awe, um, whether he'll get to uh, Washington, D.C. or not remains to be seen. That, that affected him. So, you know, Lieberman, like, you know, kind of, pounded his, his, his fist on the desk and said, you go tell Schumer, 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 being, you know, Senator Chuck Schumer from New York, the highest ranking Jewish uh, member of Congress uh, right now, said they have to give this message. And I think that more is going on behind the scenes that, that most of us know. Um, but, 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 but the question of U.S. Israel relations are also, are also at stake. You know, we based it on what we call these shared values, shared values of democracy. And if those are questioned in Israel or being questioned from, from outside, well, okay, that's, that, that, that's a difficult question. I think we as American Jews um, want to do everything we can to make sure that the U.S.-Israel relationship is, is very, very strong. I want to, um, and to be conscious of time here, I want to bring this down to the, the, the mash now, yeah. to, the, to the ground here, and I want to talk about Israelis, and then I want to talk about our neighbors. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll divide them. On July 25th, um, Brett Stevens wrote an op-ed and he writes, what is true is that the new dividing line in Israel, as is in so many other democracies, is no longer between liberals and conservatives, it is between liberals and illiberals or illiberals. Can you help us understand what he meant and, and expound on that a little bit for us? Yeah, I, I don't know if I, if I buy into exactly um, Stevens' contention, but I think, I think yes. I, 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 here's why I do agree. And then I think the dividing line is between those who think Israel should be a pure democracy versus those who think Israel should be a liberal democracy. Okay, and what's the difference? Essentially, these two conflicting values, which um, if you take out your binoculars, you'll be able to see a little bit better on this screen. Okay, <laughs> essentially, one thing... That, okay, democracy is power of the people, rule of the people, the Knesset should decide. Okay? And whatever happens, well, that's the decision of the people, and majority rules. Okay? Democracy, right? That's how the Greeks invented it, you know, in the Senate in, the, in, in ancient times. Right? Um, when we think of democracy, I think, you know, what else does it include? Not, not rhetorical. What, 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 else, what, what else are we missing here? Rights of protection, a system which, or a mechanism for protection of rights of minorities. And here, for intents and purposes, I'm going to define minority as anyone who didn't win the election. Okay? Because the majority won the election, 64 seats in the Knesset, and the minorities lost, essentially. Okay? So I think we sometimes take for granted that even if we were unhappy with the outcome of the elections, some of you may remember a time period uh, in American history from roughly from 2016 to 2020, I don't know, you know, may, may, may in, you know, re remind you of some time where some of us, I'm not saying all of us, right, some of us may have been slightly, you know, less than pleased by the outcome of that election, but we knew that there were still basic, you know, there's still freedom of speech 
okay? Right? There's still, right? Okay, we still have basic rights. That's a question. And the second one is this that supervision and limitation of the parliament and the government. What we call in America, checks and, and balances, right? And so I posed this question directly to, to member of Knesset Simcha Rothman, who is um, from the Religious Zionist Party, and he's the head of the Constitution Legal, you know, Law and Justice Committee. By the way, the immediate past chair of that committee is MK, member of Knesset, Rabbi Gilad Kariv, the first reform rabbi to be a member of Knesset, and he headed that committee, okay? Rossman now heads the committee, and he's a, a serious ideologue on these issues of judicial reform. He's written two books about it, okay? Um, and he, with his partner, that's him right there, with his partner, Yariv Levine, okay, they are pushing these, uh, these some call it reform, some call it overhaul, okay? And so I asked him point blank, I said, Mr. Rothman, you know, whenever you have talked about this and we've asked you or you've been asked in the newspaper, um, what mechanism are you going to put in place to ensure minority rights you basically respond with a very, very Israeli response. Can I give it to you in Hebrew first? Okay. So, smochalai. Okay. Or in English we say, trust me. I would, of course, never, you know, and, and he's not being cynical because he, he's, he's a nerd. Okay. He's like very, like, straightforward. Okay. He's, he, he, he's, he's, he's not, you know, he's not that kind of a politician. He's not a spin doctor. Okay. He says, very clear. Of course we'll provide for them. But, I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't trust you, okay? So you have to demonstrate to us what are the mechanisms that you're putting in place to ensure minority rights and to ensure supervision and oversight, you know, checks and balances because you're trying to remove the independence of the judiciary right now, and that, that is really, really scary. So, look, and now here's where I disagree with Stevens because I think, I, I believe in the, in, in the rule of 70. Okay, what's the rule of 70? that 70% of the people could probably agree on 70% of the issues. Okay? So if you ask the average person, even at the process, to say, do you think that Israel's system of a balance of powers right now was a perfect system? Okay? Now, Israelis are always self critical No, of course not. It's terrible. They say, do you think it needs change or reform? Probably, yes. Okay? So, what's, so, so what are you upset about? We said, not like this. And in January, at the end of January, after three weeks of, of uh, Knesset sessions, I went back and I read the Likud platform. I, the entire, you go on their website, and I, I read, read through the entire Likud platform. I said, there is not one mention of judicial reforms in the entire platform, nor was it part of the campaign. I said, well, so, okay, so, so, so what gives? If you want to sit down and... And, and talk about judicial reforms and bring in experts and do a long process and, and get the magic C word. Not yet a constitution, but consensus. Beseder gamur. Okay? Fine. Fine. But when you start shoving things down people's throat, then people start to gag. Okay? And they start to say, okay, this is, this is unacceptable. This is not tolerable. And this is what we're, we're, we're worried about. So this was unexpected, which is perhaps an added layer to the, to the issue, to the problem. Right. I mean, it's not, Simcha Rothman would not say, he's like, I wrote two books about this, right? Remember the rabbi and the flood? Okay, the rabbi, the, the, the flood starts coming, so the rabbi, you know, gets up on his roof, or her roof, and, and, and the first speedboat comes by and says, you know, get in. He says, no, don't worry, God will save me. And then another, you know, helicopter comes by, you know, rabbi, throw down the ladder. He says, no, no, don't worry, God will save me. And then, of course, he drowns, and, he, and God asks him, and he says, you, he's like, why didn't you save me? He goes, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> okay, so... Not complete. If you were reading the writing of what they were saying, not completely um, uh, unexpected. Okay, because Yariv Levine, um, he, but he said, okay, this is our opportunity, and this is the opportunity to do what um, I believe it was George W. Bush said in 2003. Those two words, shock and awe. Okay, he said, let's let's do this really fast, and let's do a blitzkrieg of legislation, and no one will be able to stop it because we're we are the majority now. We have a full tank of right wing. Y you know, uh, legislators right now. Yeah. So I want to switch gears to our neighbors a little bit. And Yossi Klein Halevi, who is an author, a scholar, 
um, and an activist in Palestinian and Israeli relations wrote a, an essay uh, that was very, very difficult, uh, very difficult to read, um, layered in truths and, and challenges. The name of the article was The, the Wounded Jewish Psyche and the Divided Israeli Soul. And in it he writes, politically, the Jewish people is divided between two profound forms of anguish and both rooted in the Holocaust. One expression of anguish is over the occupation. How is it possible the Jews who endured so much suffering are so easily reconciled to the role of seemingly permanent ruler over another? Our other anguish is over the assault on Israel's existence. How is it possible that mere decades after the Holocaust, the Jewish people is still forced to defend its right to exist. Can you help us unpack a little bit about what Yossi is saying and what does this mean yeah. for all of our neighbors in the region, not just our Palestinians, but Hamas, Hezbollah, Lebanon, I mean, really um, our, our, our entire area? Yeah. First of all, I love I love you. That essay was was very powerful, and and I've been learning from Yossi for the past you know twenty twenty five years, um, and and he he's the son of a survivor also, and and sort of carries that. But th so, first of all, I think we need to understand how many of you have met Israelis before. Okay, <laughs> some of you are Israeli. Okay, and and here's what I think that we often miss when reading the headlines: um, Israelis are a traumatized people. Okay, um, both inherited trauma through our DNA. Okay, when, and that I think we all share. Um, I, think, I think that is one aspect of being Jewish. Okay, is inheriting the, the you know the stories and the fate of our of our past, um, and then a more recent trauma of the early two thousands. Okay, I this was like you know I'm thinking about this very very much in that um, in two weeks on September thirteenth we're going to mark thirty years since the handshake on the White House lawn between President Clinton, Rabin, and Arafat, right? Do you remember? Okay, I, to date myself, I, I, I was in high school, okay, watching this on live TV, and, and that was, I, I was so filled with, with hope and with, you know, wishfulness. I say, okay, um, and then when I graduated college, and the same month that I graduated college, you know, 23 years ago or so, and Ehud Barak, the prime minister at the time, still President Clinton and Chairman Arafat, came back to Camp David to close the deal, okay? Um, I thought, okay, this was it. We're entering in, into peace, and, you know, my kids and the grandkids, they're, they're going to know peace. And then, of course, it very quickly, it quickly fell apart. Um, and, and I think Israelis have come through a deep sense of trauma from those early 2000s. Um, if you want to call it intifada, if you want to call it war, um, wh whatever, uh, where there were you know, years of terrorist bombings and, 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 and terrorism on the streets, okay, and Palestinians also. That's when Palestinians also lost, um, lost sort of faith in the PLO leadership. Okay, and it's not, uh, it's not for nothing that Hamas won sweepingly in the elections in 2005, kicked out the PLO from Gaza in 2007 in sort of a violent overthrow, okay, and that chairman, you know, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, um, who is, I think this year turns 87 years old, smokes two packs a day uh, with no succession plan, okay, is kind of holding it all together. I do recommend a, a, a very important article in Foreign Policy magazine about Hussein el-Sheikh, who's a, a potential successor to Abbas by um, Adam uh, Raskon. Um, very, very important article that just came out last week. Um, that's talking about this. So we have a sense of mutual disillusionment on, on, on each side. And I want to say that the failure of the Oslo Accords um, symbolized for many Israelis um, a loss of faith in the, in the Zionist left. Okay? And that that was the establishment party, right? The Labour Party, Ben-Gurion, Levi Eshkol, Golda Meir, then later Rabin in Paris and Barak, Okay, and that was the party that said, you know, okay, we are Zionists. We're all like, you, you know, warrior poet farmers. Okay, that's like the early Zionist ethos. And we are trying to push for peace here. Okay, some call them, you know, naive, naively doing so and trying to push forward. And then 
Yossi Klein Levy told me this over coffee a, a, a few months ago. Where he said, look, it was a mutual game of I told you so. It was the left saying, see, if you keep your boot on the necks of other people, okay, what do you expect from them? And the right saying, see, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Okay? And they're not ever going to recognize the legitimacy of having a Jewish state in our, ancient, in our ancestral homeland. Okay? And, and, and that's the situation in, in which we're in. And, and look, what, look what's going on. And I, and I think that our neighbors are sitting and watching. Okay? I, I used to be asked all the time, do you think what's happening in Syria is good for Israel? And I said, look, I don't think that's good for anybody, okay? Where, you know, 750,000 people have been killed since 2011. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a, no one can say that that's a good thing, okay? And some people have said to me, you know, well, Arabs killing Arabs is good for Jews. No, no, I'm sorry, no, no. However, I do think that the Iranians, Hezbollah, Hamas, are saying, oh, this is interesting. You know, and like taking popcorn and kind of watching this, watching Israeli society, you know, tear itself apart and rip itself, you know, from the fabrics to say like, okay, uh, when do we enter this conversation? And when do we test? And, you know, um, Defense Minister Gallant was just meeting with the UN Secretary General uh, Gutierrez this, this past week to say, look, I know that the focus is what's happening in Tel Aviv, but you really must focus on what's happening in our northern border. Because it, it, this is a perfect distraction for our neighbors, okay? So, um, can I give like a biblical pasuk right here? Okay, Please. Re, do you, you, ever, you ever get to the, the book of Nehemiah, or the book of Ezra? Okay, flip to the back, okay, of the, of the Bible, of the Tanakh, right? Okay, it, it's wonderful, right? Because you have these two characters, Ezra and Nehemiah, and they came from Babylon to rebuild the the Jewish entity, essentially, to be what you call it, Judea or Yehuda or, or whatever. They were sent there, and, and, and this is, it's one of my favorite psukim in the entire Tanakh, okay? Um, in, 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 in chapter 4, I think it's chapter 4, verse 11, if I were going to guess, um, in the book of, uh, of Ezra, where Nehemiah says, he says, Biyad echad romsim bonim choma, Okay, essentially what he's saying, in one hand we are building the wall, essentially building the city of Jerusalem, and the other hand we are holding a weapon and defending ourselves. Okay? And that's been the story, and that's the continuous story right now that we have to, okay, we're trying to figure out what are, you know, what are the rules of the game and what um, democracy is going to look at the state of Israel, and, and if we don't, maintain what um, Americans call the QME, the qualitative military edge, okay, we're going to be, um, the technical term is aftsuris, okay, we're going to be um, in, in, a, in a big, big problem right now. Um, and, th and that's why I see you in the region. Are we doing okay so far? Are we, you guys, okay, no one's, you know. No one left yet. No one's left Everybody's yet. Everybody's still okay. in their seat. Good, good, no, good. Because um, we haven't exhausted every single topic yet. So no, there's, there's we have more a lot to, uh, more. There's, there's Six more hours, right? Yeah, yeah, we have good, six good, hours. Okay, yes, yes. Um, yeah. I do want to. Yeah. I do want to leave time for yeah, questions, yeah, yeah, but I do want to yeah. bring it home to Cleveland, Wonderful. home yeah. to the reform movement, um, home in in the, the the macro and the micro. Why does this matter? Yeah. Why does this matter for us, Cleveland Jews? Why does this matter for us, Reform Jews? Why does this matter for Reform Jews in Israel? What should we, Clevelanders, Reform Jews, American Jews, be doing? How do we participate? How do we engage in a way that is meaningful um, and, and can also really be part of the conversation in a very yeah. meaningful way? Yeah, yes, yeah, th thank you for, for raising that. And I think, just given not if that question was like on your mind also, like, okay, what, it, what does it mean for us? So let me say a, a few things. Um, the response from abroad, let's say, and from the Jewish community has been interesting. Okay, that's a very American word. When you say, <laughs> what, what, you say how is that movie? Interesting. interesting. Okay, yeah. that means it was terrible. Okay, Israelis will tell you, oh, this was awful, this was terrible. I don't want to see it. It, it was interesting. Um, okay, um, and, and if you, you also say, I, I'm confused by this, that means saying, I'm, yeah. what the hell happened? Okay, um, so, so, so what should, first of all, I want to say a few things that I think are, are truances. One, I think to be a Jew requires us to have three sacred relationships. Okay, um, I, I didn't make this up. This comes from our tradition. Okay, um, 
I'll say it in Aramaic first. Yisrael oraita v'kut shebrichu. Okay? God, Torah, and Israel. All right? And if we took a poll among the crowd here at the Temple Tiferet Israel, I imagine we might have different approaches to theology, different interpretations of text of Torah, different ways of observing mitzvot. Okay? The Yofi. Okay? That's wonderful. That's, that's called pluralism. Okay? And... And I think we have different approaches to how we relate to Israel and how we connect to them. What I don't want to be, do you guys remember the reality show Survivor? Okay. I don't want to say, oh, I'm kicking Israel off the island. Okay. Essentially saying, no, I'm a Jew who just, you know, I love to come to services and be part of a Jewish community, but Israel, I want to have nothing to do with it. Okay. I, I, want, to, I, I want to say no. No, I, I, I want that to be part of our Jewish identity. First of all, I think that after 75 years, it would be unimaginable to think about what our Jewish identity be, would be like without the influence of a Jewish state. Okay? Most of us here, maybe some of us remember life before a state. Okay? Be proud of that. Whoever, you know, maybe show a hand. I may remember 1948. Okay? No, give kavod to, to our people here. Um, and, and I think that the influence of the state of Israel has permeated Jewish life so much that, that, that we don't even recognize it so much. The songs that we sing, the, the way we celebrate Chagim, the way we think about it. For so many, Israel was their connection to, to Jewish life. So, so let's say, second is, Israel is the largest Jewish community in the world right now. Okay, and to say, oh, we don't care about what happens to the largest Jewish community in the world, I think is also unfortunate. Okay, Chaval. Third, what happens in Israel does affect us very, very deeply. Okay? Um, affects us as American Jews. Uh, affects us in our day-to-day. -day. How many of you have been stopped at the proverbial water cooler talk in the office and say, oh yeah, hey, um, Mr. Horowitz, you, explain to me what's going on in Israel, you know? And you're like, okay, just because I'm Jewish, does that mean that I'm an expert on everything? Anybody happened to them like before? Okay, you can get it. Or how many of your kids on a college campus or in high school or on social media or whatever are, are feeling that? The fourth point is that we elect representatives who elect to give Israel a tremendous amount of foreign aid. Okay, we're talking about $3.8 billion annually. By the way, 80% of that stays here in the United States. Uh, we call it FMF, foreign military financing. Okay, um, so if, if Israel comes to say to us as American Jews to say, hey, that's critically important and I need you to support that in Congress, okay, um, it doesn't have to be a blind obedience. We just say, well, okay, what we're seeing, it, it, what about our values, okay? Um, and, you say, I, and, and, and I'm not suggesting for a minute, and we as the reform movement have put a very hard red line on conditioning foreign aid. Okay? Um, we have not held back in some of our criticisms for Israeli policy. All right? But we have said, no, we as a movement stand firmly behind uh, continuous foreign aid, a renewal of what's called the, the MOU, right, the Memorandum of Understanding, which will come up in 2028, again, signed by the Obama administration, okay, the biggest package that Israel's ever received, okay, and that is critically important, okay, but, but what we're, what we're seeing murmurs, especially if you looked at s some parts of the Democratic Party right now who are already there, and are saying, let's, let's condition that. Now, I'm seeing a bunch of different reactions, okay, and this may be a good segue into, um, into you know, further discussion. One, there's the, there's the um, sort of sense of, you know, it's not our place to criticize Israel. Okay, we, we're not going to go to a protest because, you know, really the nuance is going to be lost, right? We don't want to give Israel, it gives a sense of weakness and aids Israel enemies. This, you know, any critique flies in the face of unity. We ought to stand with Israel. Okay? And think about, you know, people in your sphere who, you know, may have articulated some similar positions. On the other side, I'm hearing also, oh, wrong way. Um, I'm hearing people who are saying, hey, leave me alone. I, this is all bad. You, you know, we don't want to do anything with it. It says basically, you know, we're feeling distance from Israel. We wanted to have nothing to do with it. We don't understand the nuance between supporting you know, organizations on the ground versus supporting the government of Israel. Leave me alone, okay? I, I don't want anything to do with it. Even some so far to say that, see, we told you having a Jewish state was a bad idea. Okay? 
I did not go to say to them to see, oh, um, there's some particularly problematic policies of the American government. You see, that whole federalism thing, yeah, we should just, you know, get rid of that, okay? No, we, we didn't say, so, so I, I want us to be able to nuance that. And I think the majority of us, especially in our reform movement, are somewhere in the middle, okay? This, I ruined the drama on that one, okay? To say, actually, actually, we love Israel, and we feel deeply connected to Israel in so many different ways, whether it's family, whether it's culture, whether it's politics, whether it's a sense of, you know, Jewish identity, and, you know, we love going there and visiting, and our kids go there. Yeah, you get the point, okay? And we're deeply concerned with Israel's democracy, okay? And that's where, that's sort of we are, where we are as a movement. So here's, here's a few things that I want to suggest, and then, and then maybe, is that okay if we, if we open it up? Yeah, is that, um, is, is I want to say, first of all, like, Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, that, that's not a given. To come out in the week, you know, that your kids are starting school at the end of summer, and you're going to hopefully come back in the next few weeks. There, we're having, like, some events, I think, and right? We have a few, yeah. Yeah, Rosh has done something, right. Yom Kippur. Right, you're going to come back. So it's critically important to come out. And, and, and a lot of people say to me, we don't understand what's going on, okay? Anybody ever heard that? Oh, we don't know. It's too complex. So my response is, you know, so what are you doing about that? Okay, I had a professor in grad school who used to just look at me and say, sit down and, and read. We have to understand what's going on, okay? And I'll be um, selflessly, shame, uh, you know, or, or shamelessly promotional, self-promotional is what I meant to say, uh, and I offer you to scan that QR code on the back of your programs tonight, and you can follow along uh, to a blog that I write once a week. Because, you know, yeah, Al, I, was, I was looking at this crowd, and I was saying, you know what you guys need? is one more email in your inbox on a Friday morning. <laughs> hey, um, you don't have to promote it. I read your newsletter every week. Yeah. It ah, is so you're the one. I'm the, okay. I'm the. No, very good. So, so, and, then, and then I think, I think we need to find ways of, of, of not ignoring this. We, uh, American society is often um, conflict averse. Okay, let's not talk about things that are, you know, like, let's talk about the bat mitzvah movie on Netflix and not talk about, um, you know, really contentious <laughs> issues. Okay, uh, let's not get into it. Ohio politics, I don't want to go there, okay, right now. Um, so, so let's, let, let it, let's, yes, find ways to talk about and to bring this up. And then let's also find ways to support organizations that represent your values, Okay, I'll give you a statistic. Um, I, I keep going back to, you know, the Trump administration, but I'll just remember on, on November 9th of 2016, you know, I was sitting like everyone else watching the election returns, and I'm watching also my social media feed, you know, Facebook, Twitter, X, I think it's called, you know, Instagram, wh whatever, and everyone in my feed was saying, okay, I just gave 36 bucks to Planned Parenthood, or I just supported the ACLU, or I'm making a donation to the ADL, or to the rack of Reform Judaism in Washington, right, to, to uphold social justice and, 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 and liberal values. And I read that the ACLU, okay, the American Civil Liberties Union, in that month alone of November 2016, got 7,000 times its annual uh, rate of, of, for development, their, their, their annual fundraising campaign. 7,000 times. That's astronomical. They didn't know what to do with all that money, okay? Yet when I say to many people, I say, okay, would you do the same for similar organizations? We also have, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite partial to our reform movement who's doing the work on the ground, whether it's in our congregations, whether it's the Israel Religious Action Center who has just won a petition to the Supreme Court to recognize surrogacy for single-sex couples. Okay, serious, serious stuff. We're going to see the issues on the um, bus segregation coming back after 10 years when, that we won. Okay, they're fighting on the ground. I said, okay, the, I, I said, why don't, why don't we support those organizations? And people are saying, well, I don't want to support Israel right now. I said, okay, so don't buy Israel bonds. Okay. By the way, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, fine. If you do that, it's also good. By the way, the state of Ohio is one of the large, I think it's $143 million in, in Israel bonds. So, okay, that's great. And now times have changed. And what I would recommend is we need to build up civil society on the ground in Israel. Right? And I'm proud of our reform movement for, for, for doing that. And I think that we can do that collectively as, as a kihila, right? As a community, as a synagogue, as part of a movement. Um, and I think that we are doing it some, and I think we have a, a great potential to grow in that, in that field.
Thank you, Josh. Um, there's so much more to say. I feel like we didn't get to, and, and, and I mean, we could really be here all night, like how this is affecting Israelis on a day-to-day, -day. and you talked about the bus segregation, which is something that's very serious and very scary, and um, our conversation is definitely not, not over. At this time, um, we're gonna take just a few questions, um, and Carol Marshall has the microphone, and if you wanna turn left to your John Dunn, he will start us off. Perhaps. <laughs> oh, and we will repeat that, but thank you, John. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Above the fray, geopolitical point of view. Uh, would you give some comments about the participation of this government, the Netanyahu government, in what is reported to be a fairly advanced dialogue with Saudi Arabia, and whether that is genuine or intended to buy him runway um, to further drive the bus off the yeah. cliff? Yeah, um, okay, so the Saudis, and, and here, you know, this is, I, I'm not an expert on what's going on in the Saudis, but I, I'll, I'll try and say what I know quickly. So everybody remembers that in 2020, um, the, we signed the Abraham Accords, okay, which was a normalization agreement between um, Gulf states, you know, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, also Sudan and Morocco as well. Tremendous, tremendous achievement. Okay, very, very important. And did a few things. Instead of, you know, opening the, um, you know, economic, and you know, over a million Israelis visited UAE and Dubai, okay, over the last couple of years. Um, and a few people from there came to Israel as well. What that did was turn the Kerry Doctrine, right? Remember former Secretary of State John Kerry? Okay, turned it on its head because Kerry maintained the principle that the only way to have sort of regional peace, okay, or normalization and recognition from the Gulf states was through the Palestinians. Okay? And this did the opposite. This basically ignored the Palestinians okay, and went straight to the, the Gulf states. Okay, there's a lot more commentary. Um, the Israel Policy Forum wrote an excellent report. You can get it on their website, uh, which, which I recommend reading. But the last sort of big prize and the crown jewel in the career of Prime Minister Netanyahu would be to have this normalization uh, relationship with the Saudis. Okay, remember, the Saudis have been active participants in this for a long time. Remember in 2002, with the quartet, there was the Saudi plan that they, you know, were gonna, were gonna convene. The Saudis are critically important for their religious authority, right, the seat of Mecca, and for their oil wealth, and, 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 and they sort of call the shots. You know, everybody looks over to the Saudis to get permission. Now, everyone thought that Itamar Ben-Gvir, okay, the Minister of, Nas or Minister of National Security right now, and, you know, a Kahanist, racist, extremist, all of that, um, would now sort of take the Saudi deal off the table. Um, I think that if, if Netanyahu gets an invitation to the White House, be because there's progress on the Saudi front, they had come back and said, okay, no, it's not going to happen right now. There's going to be no progress as long as you keep passing these judicial reforms, okay? Um, and the Saudis have to figure out a way to do that while saving face and potentially, potentially including um, the Palestinians in the agreement. Two things that happened this week that we should be aware of. One, of course, the guffaw of Israel's foreign minister and sort of not being able to contain himself. Um, it's, it, it's like, I remember, you know, one of my kids came and said, you know, Abba, I have a secret that I can't tell you that I just took candy out of the drawer, okay? Um, and <laughs> he said, oh, I just had this secret meeting with the foreign minister of Libya in Italy just now. I'd be like, Dude, that was a secret. Like that, okay, um, and that that created really, really serious ramifications. She had to flee Libya for her life, okay, and and go take refuge in Turkey, um, and so the Saudis are watching that and like, oh my God, you guys aren't serious here, okay. And then just conveniently, after thirty years of direct flights from Israel to the Seychelles Islands, okay. Um, uh, there was technical troubles with the plane, and it landed very peacefully and safely in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And you interview these Israelis, 
who are like kind of like, you know, taking their last week of vacation before school starts on September 1st, and they're like, huh, I guess we're in Saudi Arabia. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, and the Saudis sort of welcomed them with open arms, and like, 30 years, there's never been an issue. Okay, never had a land of plane in Saudi Arabia, and all of a sudden this week, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, okay, so I won't suggest that. But uh, who knows if that's like testing the waters of some future thing. I, I think it will happen, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a matter of time if, if it will happen, and Netanyahu will do as much as he can to take credit. Maybe, if I can suggest, maybe we'll take a few questions. Okay, I know there are a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Rabbi. I just, uh, before this text, stood with my dear friend Paul Kipnis, who uh, adores you. Uh, Paul, Rabbi Kipnis. Oh, Kipnis, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you can't trust his opinion. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, two things. One is I just wanted to, you taught me and so many of us a lot tonight, but one little thing I, I, I pains me to share with you is that there are no streets that are Rabbi Alba Hillel Silver in Israel. They are doctor. Rabbi Alba Hillel Silver, and that is just a little micro of the extremist, uh, extremist uh, policies of uh, the, uh, the very conservative government that to this day we are not recognized. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you though is that um, when I was in youth group with Rabbi Paul Mm. and uh, very involved, to me Judaism as a Reformed Jew is all about social justice. It is who I am to the core. That is my Judaism. And um, if we look around the room, we don't see people like Rabbi Paul and me in high school. They're not here. And I'm a college professor, and I, I am around youth, Jewish youth all the time. And they don't feel, the majority of them don't feel the way that we did. And what's going to happen soon? Uh, does Israel really not care about American Jewry? Okay, okay. Wait, tell is me your name again. Yeah, yeah. Is there another question? Somebody else had their hand up? Thomas, I think. Robin? Question. Here. You uh, mentioned Ben Gvir, and the current government in Israel, in the polls, will not sustain itself if the election were held next month. Yeah. So they're all hanging in to keep this government, each for, how many did you name, five or six parties, with not consistent agendas. Right. The Hill Boys are not what the Likud voters voted for. Sure. Would you please explain that? Yeah. Okay. And let's do one more. Five governments have gone down in four years. What's going to bring this government down? And is it the vote on uh, the Haredi and the army? Because I can't believe that there aren't two people in that coalition who would leave that, this government for that. But why is this government stronger than others? Or is it not? And sometime within the next year, it'll go down. Yeah. Okay. I know that there are more questions, and we're going to hang out um, afterwards, and I'm happy to schmooze and talk more, but, you know, Zionism was a liberation movement, so I want to liberate us all uh, you know, from, uh, from, from here. But, but let, me start from, let me start from the last question and work my way back to Daniel's really important question. Um, I'll say, so, so in terms of the coalition politics, I'll say this. Um, what motivates people almost more than their own ideology, sometimes sadly to say, is power. Okay, you know, I, I can understand what the ultra-Orthodox agenda is. I can understand what the religious Zionists or the ultra-nationalist agenda is. And when I say, well, what is the Likud's agenda? What are they looking to get out of this? Um, and the answer comes out, it's, you know, it's not terribly profound, um, but it is, the, is the notion of power. Okay, now, in terms of what could bring this government down, I see two things. One, I think that this attempt to equate our military service, risking one's life for the security of the state to be on par with sitting all day and learning Talmud. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a ra I love a good Torah study. Okay? I want to geek out all day reading the Parsha. We can talk halakha, Talmud. You know, let's, let's get into it deep. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't presume to say 
um, that I could do that without having security here, okay? And that goes for every congregation here, our own, okay? Um, and, and we've seen painful examples of that, okay? I think that pill was a little too big for some, even in the coalition, to swallow, okay? Some who are career military people. Um, there are 13 Knesset members who made their wanks through, you know, the security system to become a Knesset member. They're like, wait, wait a second, like, okay, let's, let's, let, let's hold on a minute. That could bring down, and then the, the second, you know, so the, the Haredi agenda has gone way too far, okay? Um, the other is the issue of security, I think, is that they're saying, okay, what you guys are doing are, is actually endangering, you know, putting lives in danger, okay? That, I think, could cause, an, you know, we only need four Knesset members to um, defect, essentially, and say, okay, this is, this is one too much for us. I think that um, the threat of being exiled to the throes of the opposition, okay, is far greater than um, the having to compromise on someone's agenda. So, for instance, if we say, okay, give up on the draft bill, and you can stay in power and still get you know, unbelievable budget line, you know, budget allocations for your yeshivot, I think the Haredim will, in the end, say, we've already seen them starting to walk back this, because they tasted, they were like in an 18-month um, timeout, okay, where they weren't in the, in the ruling coalition this past year, and mm, they didn't like it so much, okay? Uh, so they are in a better position now, just in terms of budget, power, ministries that they have, and I think they would be foolish to, to risk that and bring down the government. Similar to, I forgot, I didn't catch your name? John? Yeah, no, in back of, um, who asked about who asked about the coalition politics um, to say, you know, I think Ben Gvir is going to learn um, that he also can't push it too much or else the people will have a total revolt. The religious Zionist camp is, 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 in, is in a real moment of inflection and they're, they're in trouble. I was asking my religious Zionist friends, by the way, I also consider myself a religious Zionist, okay? Um, small R, capital Z, okay? Um, and so th there was, I say, who, who are you going to vote for this time? Okay, because Naftali Bennett's party, which was sort of the moderate modern Orthodox Zionist party, kind of folded into itself and, and fizzled out to leave room for the extremists. Okay, th th that's a big problem for them. Okay, and, and, and they're kind of showing their, their true colors, uh, pushing, you know, de facto, which will lead to de jure annexation. Um, of Judea it also and Samaria, echoes the Israel's yeah, complexity of Jewish identity. Oh my gosh. Right? What does it yeah. mean to be dati? What does it mean to be religious? What does it mean right. to be secular? But is it secular in the way that we're American secular? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's yeah. a different, it's, it's a totally different, you know, I have people who say, yeah, I'm totally secular, but they do Shabbat. Right, right. right? Totally secular, so but I minds, put on tefillin every morning. You right, know? The, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So it's a different, yeah. it's a totally different, it's a it's question a of a melange mindset. identity. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. And so, um, I think that they can find enough common ground to have like their dream of a full right-wing government that will prevent them, prevent the government from, uh, from you know, sort of fissuring out and, and, you know, going to new elections. Um, and the third issue that could come up is we're waiting to see what happens with Netanyahu's trial. Okay, uh, he literally is going to court every Monday and Thursday. I, I'm serious. He has to turn up in court over these three uh, cases of corruption. Um, and if, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I think there's something going on also in, in the United States where we're watching, <laughs> watching that as, as well. Um, and and, and it's, it's a fascinating moment. Okay, let's, it, I think Daniel raised, raised the big question. And I think what you're touching on, Daniel, is an issue of universalism versus particularism. Okay, and that we Jews have been taught, and we grew up on the notion of, uh, of, of you know, the prophetic vision that we have to, you know, um, fulfill the notion of the prophets. By the way, sometimes I remind Reformed Jews, I'm like, go back and read the prophets. Actually, that, that's with a PH. Okay, um, we need to be profitable as well. But um, go back and read them. They weren't all sort of lovey-dovey kumbaya and like equality, pluralism, tolerance. Okay, they also said some pretty tough things. Okay, just if you read the Haftarah every week this week, okay, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, okay, it was not like you know, oh, everyone's equal and we love each other. Like, okay, it, it was pretty hard stuff. Um, but yes, m much of what the reform movement has pushed and continues to push 
is an agenda that we should live in a society that is a just society. Okay, we call it social justice now, right? And that means that we have to fight racism, okay? And that means that we have to push for, you know, equality for uh, ev everyone, for women, for LGBTQIA, for, you know, everyone who sits by us and, and, and beyond just our own Dalit Amot, as we say, just beyond our own insular community, okay? And, and I feel like that shouldn't be terribly controversial to say, Okay, that everyone is created equal and everyone is entitled to the same rights. Okay, Sh shouldn't be too hard to say. Now, here's the lesson I learned from Rabbi Dick Hirsch, who's a you know a Cleveland, a Cleveland native, who founded the Religious Action Center in Washington D.C. because he said our movement is Reformed Jews. We have to be part of this civil rights movement. So they purchased a building in Washington, D.C., and then turned to Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and others and said, you know, use this building as your headquarters. Okay, and let's do that. And we signed the Voting Rights Act in the conference room of the Religious Action Center of Reformed Judaism in 1964, and we're incredibly proud of that. But what the story that most people don't hear then is that what did he do 10 years later? Well, he made Aliyah. And he relocated the headquarters of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, our world international body of Reformed Judaism, to be in Jerusalem. And he used to grab me by the shirt. Okay, he, he, he passed away. His birthday is September 13th, the same day as the handshake of the White House lawn. Um, he, would be, um, he would be 97 this year. He passed away in 2021. Okay, he used to grab me by the, the, the by, you know, by the jacket, and he would say, "Zionism is a social justice movement." Okay, and he would say the quote that you all know it by heart. We read it last week or two weeks ago in the parsha, right? Justice, just shall you pursue, right? Tzedek, tzedek, your dof. Okay, I will buy the first ice cream to anyone who can f finish the verse. Okay, because it says, it says, Tzedek Tzedek Tzedof, Leman, right? Leman Techiena V'yerastata Aretz Hashia Ani Yonai Alech Noten Lach. Okay, so that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God has given you. And his Torah was to say that essentially our inheritance of the land and our building a Jewish sovereign political entity was in fact conditional on it being a just society. And that's at the core of our, of our, of our Zionism. So last November I took 13 um, social justice activists from our movement, okay, Jews of color, LGBTQ, people from different walks of life who were all sort of active in different um, social justice causes in the States, and, and I brought them to Israel in a project that I'm calling Just Zionism, okay, or Tzionut Tzedek, essentially, to say, wait a second, instead of seeing Israel and Zionism as being somehow antithetical to progressive or social justice values, okay, it's just like in the United States. There are people who, you know, there are people of all sorts of different views. You have right-wing extremists as well, um, and you have people who are fighting for, you know, for, for, for these values. I said, let's go meet the people on the ground doing the work, okay? And let's understand how the issues are playing out here and how the issues are playing out there. Um, and we did that. We spent a week, and, you know, hopefully if we get funding more for that, we can continue to do that because, we, 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 and, and I, I, I continue to meet with, you know, college students and people in their 20s and 30s who, like the buzzword right now is, what is the great evil? If someone were to ask you, what was the great evil of the last 200 years, okay? I would, I would point to Hitler and Stalin, let's say. Like, okay, they've killed more people, you know, than anyone can, okay? But I think the common phrase is, no, the great evil right now is settler colonialism. And what is the example of that? Israel, okay? That's, that's a buzzword going on in a, you know, a lot of college campuses. And I said, okay, well, w wait a second. Let's, 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 let's relearn the Zionist story and to say, here's what, here's what the Zionist founders sort of had in mind of building this utype, utopian egalitarian society. And our Zionism is about continuing to do that work. I'm of the belief that Zionism did not end in 1948 with the establishment of the state. Okay, there are, th there are those who, who say that. And I, I said, no, I think Zionism is doing that work to, to create that just society. And here it's about, you know, the world is very small now, okay, that we can, 
um, be in touch with, 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 with the people and really learn from our shared experiences. And, and I want to leave us with, you know, a, a, as we say, you know, a chetzin nechemta or a chetzin nechema, you know, a, a little bit of hope um, in that we, as, and we spoke about this earlier in the afternoon, in the evening, we as American Jews, um, we have a lot to offer in addition to our checkbooks, as, as I mentioned. Okay? First of all, we figured out how to build vibrant, caring community in a privatized economy where the government does not support our religious institutions. Okay? We do it ourselves. This You built yourselves. Okay? And it's, it, 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 it's amazing. It's wonderful. Okay? And we also have a lot of experience um, in you, you know, winning justice issues, both in, in the legislature, in our states, and, you know, I'm thinking of the Cleveland, you know, Howard Metzenbaum, okay, how many of you remember Senator Metzenbaum, um, okay, right, who, when Dick Hurst spoke here um, in the 60s, he goes, why is there no Howard Metzenbaum, okay, as, and then a few years later, he, I mean, you know the story better than I do, okay, he ran, and, and he came up, so, okay, we, We've known how to do that. We know how to organize. We know how to mobilize. And we know how to speak up. And we know how to translate our values into applicable instances in, in, you know, happening in society. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. And so, like, when I'm talking with leaders of the protests uh, in Israel, like, there's no playbook right now. They're like, okay, well, what should we do next? How can we reach people of power? And how can we galvanize our community? And I think a reform movement is really internalizing this lesson very much. Okay, because in Israel, we've always gone for the judiciary. We've always gone, you know, if something's bad, well, let's file a petition in the court. Let's sue, okay? And I think we, right now we're, we're, we're sort of realizing that there's this huge gap in society, apropos Brett Stevens and what he said about liberals and illiberals, and I think now's the time to really, really dig in deep and try to do that work. So I'll end with saying with my, my one of my Zionist heroes, Anat Hoffman, used to always say, it's much easier to wring your hands than it is to roll up your sleeves. Amen. I hope as this year comes upon us um, that we can together roll up our sleeves and fight for that Jewish and democratic state. Toda Raba. Thank you so much, Rabbi Weinberg. You have given us so much to think about. Um, this is definitely lehit ra'ot. We'll see you later, but definitely not shalom or goodbye. This conversation was timely, and we really hope that we're going to see everyone in the coming weeks as our high holidays approach, our time for reflection, our time for being together, for gathering in community, and remembering that our community doesn't just end in Ohio, but extends across the ocean. And our desert journey for 40 years, as we read about in our Torah each and every single cycle, is not uh, just literal and it is not necessarily just historical, but it is also one that we walk every day. Every day is a desert journey, and this is yet another desert journey that we're going to traverse, hopefully, together, yad biyad. And as we close in a moment, I just want to give a few thank yous to everybody who made this possible. First of all, thank you so much to our board president, Beth Derry. Our executive director, Augie Napoli. Our director of operations, Jen Mendelson. Our director of communications, Joanna Cullinan. Our director of membership, Allison Chippy, And our support staff, Amy Aquila, Cheryl Ross, Cindy Wilson, Shira Shields, and Carrie Hinton. And of course, our marshals that were here, Dennis Cott and Carol Marshall, thank you so much. At this moment, I invite you to please rise as we close this moment with the words of Hatikva, hope, and Ose Shalom, a prayer for peace. The words are inside of the packets that you collected on your way here. Singing, we're singing. Kolod baleva penima nefesh yehudi omia ulfate mizrach kadima ein letzion sofia od lo avda. Tikvateinu, 
שנת אלפיים, לי אתם חופשי בארצנו, ארץ ציון וירושלים, לי אתם חופשי בארצנו, ארץ ציון וירושלים. שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמרו אמן יעשה שלום יעשה שלום שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל יעשה שלום יעשה שלום שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you in the coming weeks. שבוע טוב, have a wonderful week. שבוע טוב, שנה טובה. שנה טובה, גמר חתימה טובה. And don't forget to sign up with that QR code on the back of your program and you can get our emails. תודה.